stops right there, you would point the ball fair. Right? So it's over here, we have a foul ball. And now, the fair foul ball is not judged. You don't make any call on fair foul on a bounding ball, which is one that hits the bat and then hits within the infield first. Right? You don't judge that as fair or foul until it stops. That would be fair. Stops, foul. Is touched. As soon as it's touched, that would be foul. Is touched, that's fair. So when it stops or is touched, when it's rolling in the infield, that's when you make the call and not before that. Right? Or when the ball bounced past first or third base, which we'll get to in a minute. Right? Now, it's always judged by the relative position of the ball and the line. It, the fielder's feet or body have nothing to do with the judgment. The judgment is always where is the ball in relation to the line. All right? Now this ball could hit the ground and roll and change directions several times. Right? And you would not make the call until it finally stops or is touched. And at that time, you judge it fair or foul. Now we're going to talk about the judgment of fair foul ball in the situations where the ball touches the ground on the infield side of the base first, right after it comes off the bat. You can't call it fair or foul until it stops or is touched or it goes beyond first or third base. Now it's ruled by where the ball crosses the base. So the ball could actually touch down in foul territory and with a lot of spin on it, it comes up and goes over the base and lands on the other side of the base, that would be a fair ball because it went over the bag fair. Right? You could have another one that touches in here fair and then because of the spin comes up over the base and then its next landing is in foul territory. But that would be a fair ball because it went over the base fair. Right? Now for balls that first touch the ground beyond first or third base, meaning that they came right off the bat and the first time they touched the ground was here, you would rule it by where it is when it hits the ground. You know, if it comes off the bat and it first touches the ground here, you have a foul ball. So if it touch, touches the ground, you have to wait until it goes past the bag or is touched. If it first touches the ground out here, you don't have to wait. You call it immediately. Okay, now we're going to give some examples of the fact that it's where the ball is in relation to the line, and it has nothing to do with the position of the fielder. You have to judge where the ball was when it's touched. Right? So we're going to give an example here where he touches the ball, and then it goes in one side of the field and it falls to the other. So here's one where he's going to touch it in fair territory, and it's going to fall foul. There we go. Yeah, that would be a fair ball because he touched it over fair territory. Where it eventually landed is irrelevant to the call. You call it as soon as he touches it. And right, here's one where he's going to be in foul. He's going to touch it foul and knock it into fair. Right, that's a foul ball because he was over foul territory when he touched the ball. Now we're going to have one where he's, his body is in foul territory but he touches the ball in fair territory. Right, that's a fair ball. Right? Pretty simple. Always judge it by the, where the ball is, when it's touched or stops, and then you'll get the call right. The players and I are now going to create some plays that deal with the running lane situation. Rule 605K, a batter is out when in running the last half of the distance from home base to first base, while the ball is being fielded to first base, he runs outside to the right of the three-foot lane or inside to the left of the foul line, and in the umpire's judgment, in so doing, interferes with the fielder taking the throw at first base, except that he may run outside to the right of the three-foot lane or inside to the left of the foul line to avoid a fielder attempting to field a batted ball. All right, you guys want to take position? The running lane requires a lot of judgment and a lot of knowledge about how to make the judgment. The rule is that the runner is out if he interferes with the fielder taking the throw at first base. 
He's not out just because he runs out of the lane, nor is he safe because he runs in the lane. You have to judge whether there was interference with the fielder taking the throw, not the fielder making the throw. In this first example, we're going to show that the runner runs entirely outside the lane, the entire distance to first base, but he's not out because he did not interfere with the fielder taking the throw. Another thing that you have to consider in making your judgment as to whether the runner has interfered or not is the fact that first base is in fair territory. The runner has to come out of the lane in the last step or two in order to touch the base, so you wouldn't call him out for interference if something happened there that was unintentional on his last step at the base. On this example, the runner is running outside the lane and he hit, gets hit by the throw. In this case, the call is pretty easy. He's outside the lane, so you're going to judge that he intentionally tried to interfere with the throw. So if he's hit by the throw, he has interfered with the fielder taking the throw while he was outside the lane. That's interference. This is another example of the runner outside the lane and being hit by the throw. It's a little bit different. It's a case where he could be interfering even if he wasn't hit because he's outside the lane. It's any kind of interference to the fielder trying to take the throw that would be part of your judgment. Interference with the throw must be intentional, and the fact that he's outside the lane is helping you make your judgment that he was intentionally trying to interfere. To summarize this rule, just remember that interference with the thrown ball must be intentional. The running lane is just helping you make the decision of intent or not. If he's entirely outside the lane, the whole distance to first base, then it's going to make your judgment pretty easy that it's interference. Just remember, he's not out just because he's outside the lane nor is he safe just because he's inside the lane. The primary decision is whether or not he interfered with the fielder taking the throw. Rule 6.05i. A batter is out when, after hitting or bunting a foul ball, he intentionally deflects the course of the ball in any manner while running to first base. The ball is dead and no runners may advance. Now we're going to deal with the situation where the batter bunts a ball and it's rolling in foul territory and it looks like it's going to go back fair and that wouldn't be to his advantage, so he decides he's going to make it go foul. So he deliberately interferes with the course of a foul ball, in which case he would be out. Now, if he accidentally is hit by the foul ball while he's running to first, then it's just still a foul ball. You're looking for the intentional action. Approved ruling after 7.09L. When a catcher and batter runner going to first base have contact when the catcher is fielding the ball, there is generally no violation and nothing should be called. Now we're going to deal with the situation where the catcher and the batter have a little bit of a tangle up or a collision as the batter hits the ball and starts off for first base. Now in normal situations, the offense can't interfere with the fielder's attempt to field the ball. But the rules are a little bit different dealing with this immediate situation as right around the circle of the plate as they start to, their action. So we're going to show that to you right now. As you can see, both players are doing what they're supposed to be doing here. There's no interference or obstruction. Rule 6.06. .06. A batter is out for illegal action when C. He interferes with the catcher's fielding or throwing by stepping out of the batter's box or making any other movement that hinders the catcher's play at home base. This rule applies only when the pitch is caught and the play is at home base and the catcher is immediately making an attempt to retire a runner. If the ball gets away from the catcher, other rules apply. Now we're going to talk about interference that can occur around the plate between the batter and the catcher when the catcher is trying to attempt to retire a runner. This rule is pretty complicated. A lot of people don't understand it because when the batter is in the box as he is right now, if the pitch is thrown and the catcher catches the pitch and the batter stays in the box, then he's not going to be guilty of interference unless he makes some un ordinary movement that's going to interfere with the play. Right? It's the catcher's responsibility to try to find a lane to throw in. So for instance, if we have a runner on second trying to steal third, the catcher catches the pitch and steps back, he needs to step back here and throw behind the batter. Right? If the batter stays still, that's fine. Now, If the batter steps out of the box and interferes with his attempt to make the play, then we're going to have interference. Now the thing that's a little bit hard to understand and it's 
tough to judge for umpires is you have to judge an attempt to make a play. Interference is with interfering with an attempt to make a play. So you have to decide if this catcher pops up and chooses not to throw, you have to decide whether he chose not to throw because he thought the runner was going to make it and he had no chance to get him, or whether he was actually hindered by the batter. Right? Now, if the batter's simply standing in the box, then the catcher stops. That's, not, that's his responsibility. He needs to go ahead and find a way to throw. Right? Now, if the batter steps out of the box and the catcher stops his throw, then you've got a tough judgment to make. Because you've got to say, did he stop his throw because he chose to or because it actually hindered his attempt to make the play. Basically, as an umpire, you need to see him actually try to start to make a throw before you're going to call interference. If he aborts his attempt to make the play, something down here, that's not interference. But if he gets up here and starts to go and then stops because the batter's in an illegal position, then you'd have interference. I know it's kind of hard to picture, so we're going to go ahead and show you some real action and show you which is legal and which isn't. In this example, the pitch is caught by the catcher and the batter remains motionless in the box, so the catcher steps back and throws to third. There's no interference on this play. In this example, the batter steps out of the box and interferes with the catcher's play, so he's going to be out. To make your judgment on this, he's not out just because he steps out of the box. He's out if he steps out of the box and interferes with the play. If he steps out of the box and interferes with the play, it doesn't matter whether the in interference was intentional or not. The fact that he interfered out of the box makes him out. Sometimes there's interference without a play being made, in which case there's no penalty. A batter may unintentionally interfere with the catcher while no play is being made by the catcher. This is called interference without a play, and when it occurs, the ball is dead and runners must return to their time of pitch base, but no outs are called. For example, on a return toss when the catcher is trying to throw the ball back to the pitcher and the batter accidentally interferes with that toss, the runners would not be able to advance, but there would be no out. Now there's a situation where the backswing could interfere with the catcher. A batter's backswing occurs after he has swung through the pitch and he continues to swing all the way around until the bat reaches the vicinity of the catcher. If a batter contacts the catcher or his mitt or the baseball unintentionally with his backswing, it is interference without a play. If the catcher is in the act of throwing the ball in a play against a runner and the backswing contacts him, the throw should be allowed to occur, and if it results in the out of the runner played against, the interference is nullified and the play stands. If the throw does not directly result in the out of the runner played against, or the throw is not made, it is considered interference without a play. The ball is dead and runners must return to their time of pitch bases. 7.11. The players, coaches, or any member of an offensive team shall vacate any space, including both dugouts, needed by a fielder who is attempting to field a batted or thrown ball. Penalty. Interference shall be called and the batter or runner on whom the play is being made shall be declared out. Okay, now we're going to talk about the situation where the batter can interfere with the catcher's play on a loose ball. I call a loose ball a thrown or pitched ball that's gotten away from the fielder. So it's really not in flight to make a play. It's just wandering around loose and the player's trying to get after it. Now, that's not technically a play. He can make a play once he gets the ball, but we're not going to let interference happen that's really intentional. And on loose balls, the act by the offense has to be pretty darn blatant before you're going to charge him with a penalty. So we're going to give you some examples here. It's important to note that in situations like this, there's a difference between when the catcher catches the ball versus when the ball gets away from him. When the ball gets away from him, the batter must vacate any space necessary, but the batter needs to have time to react to what's going on, and you wouldn't call interference unless he did something with an intent to interfere. In this play, the ball gets away from the catcher, and he immediately pops up to make a play, but there wasn't any time for the batter to react to what was happening and he couldn't vacate any space. This would not be interference because he didn't have time to react and didn't do anything intentional. On this play, the ball gets away from the catcher and there's possible interference by someone other than the batter. Remember, anyone on the offensive team could be called for interference, but on a loose ball, it's gonna have to be blatant. In this case, the on-deck batter really doesn't know what's happening and didn't do anything intentional, so there wouldn't be a penalty. 7.08. 
any runner is out when J, he fails to return at once to first base after overrunning or oversliding that base. If he attempts to run to second, he is out when tagged. If after overrunning or oversliding first base, he starts toward the dugout or toward his position and fails to return to first base at once, he is out on appeal when he or the base is tagged. Now we're going to talk about the rule that deals with the batter when he overruns first base on a ground ball. There's a lot of myths about this one too. Some people believe that he has to turn to the right, otherwise he's liable to be put out. It's not correct. The rule states that the runner must immediately return to the base. So we're going to show some examples here of what's legal and what's not and what the fielder can do. In this play, the umpire must judge whether the runner made an attempt to go to second base or whether he immediately returned to first base. In this play, the runner clearly makes an attempt to go to second base. So he would be out when tagged. In this play, the runner overruns the base and starts to come back immediately to the base, but before he does, he changes his mind and makes an attempt to go to second. So he has not immediately returned to the base, therefore he's out when tagged. This play is an example of Rule 710C where an appeal can be made because the runner overruns the base and then thinking he was out, he heads off towards the dugout without trying to return to the base. The fielder's not required to chase him down and tag him, so he, the runner is out on appeal. Now we're going to talk about the runner's entitlement to a base, when he's legally entitled to the base and when he's not. A little confusion about when a force play is on and when a force play is not on. Who you call out and who's got a right to the base. It gets pretty confusing sometimes when two people are at a base. So we're going to show you right now. In this play, the runner who was on second at the beginning of the play stays at the base and for some reason the batter runner comes around to second base. The runner who was originally at second is entitled to the base. He's not forced off of it. So the following runner, the batter runner in this case, is out when tagged. In this play, there's a runner on first and second. And for some reason, the runner on second, even though he's forced to go on the play, stays at the base. So in this case, when both runners are at the base, the following runner is entitled to it. The lead runner is forced off, and he's out when tagged. In this play, there's runners on first and second, so a force play is involved. A force is when the batter becomes a runner when he hits a fair batted ball. In the instant that he becomes a runner, runners are forced to vacate their base and can be put out by being tagged or the base that they're forced to advance to is tagged. In this play, there's runners on first and second, so the runner on second is forced to go to third when the batter becomes a runner. But now the force is removed when the fielder tags the base to get the runner from first out and for some reason this runner comes back to the base which is okay because he's no longer forced to vacate it. Rule 708A paragraph 1. Any runner is out when he runs more than three feet away from a direct line between bases to avoid being tagged unless his action is to avoid interference with the fielder fielding a batted ball. Alright now we're going to demonstrate the rule about the line between the bases and when a runner would be called out for running out of the baseline to avoid a tag. As you can see in this picture, there's two lines. The line on the left is the line between the bases. The line where the arrow is, is a line between bases. The runner must not run more than three feet outside of a line between the bases. So he establishes his own line for the purposes of this rule. He has to stay on the line between himself and the base and not go more than three feet outside of that to avoid a tag. The rule only applies at the point when a tag attempt is made. He can run anywhere he wants at any other time. You can see at this point that the runner has gone more than three feet outside a direct line between bases. The runner would be out in this situation. Rule 708H. Any runner is out when he passes a preceding runner before such runner is out. Now you'll note in this rule that it doesn't matter whether the ball is alive or dead. If it was a home run and the ball was dead and a runner passes another, he's still out. 
If the ball is alive when one runner passes another, the ball is still alive. All right, now we're going to talk about a pretty simple play, just where the one runner passes another. It's really not too difficult. If one guy passes the runner, he's out, the ball is still alive. It's, the thing is, they can't, doesn't matter who goes in front. When one guy winds up in front of the other, the guy who's in closest to the next base is the one that's out. This example is a simple case of the runner passing another. The one with the arrow pointing at him is the one that's out. This is an example of where the trailing runner winds up in front of the other runner, but it wasn't his fault. It doesn't matter how he passed the other runner. When he winds up closer to the next base, he's out. Rule 710. Any runner shall be called out on appeal when, B, with the ball in play, while advancing or returning to a base, he fails to touch each base in order before he or a missed base is tagged. Approved ruling. 1. No runner may return to touching missed base after a falling wind runner has scored. 2. When the ball is dead, no runner may return to touching missed base or one he has left after he has advanced to and touched a base beyond the missed base. In this example, the runner going from first to third, clearly fails to touch or misses second base and ends up at third base. The ball is alive, so the defense may now appeal, and they have two choices as to how they may make the appeal. They can throw the ball to third base and tag the runner there and appeal that he missed second base and he would be called out. Or they may throw the ball to second base and tag second base and appeal that he missed the base and he would be declared out. On this play, if for some reason the ball became dead because someone asked for timeout or some other reason, they could still do the same procedure, but they must put the ball in play first. They put the ball in play by the pitcher standing on the rubber with the ball, and the umpire says play. At that point, the pitcher may step off the rubber, and they may follow the same procedure as I previously explained when the ball was live. Any appeal must be made before the next pitch or play. The appeal itself is not a play. A play is when you try to retire a runner who's attempting to advance. So if they just make the appeal, they can continue to make appeals. If they play on a runner who takes off for the next base, now they've made a play on him, not an appeal, and they lose their right to appeal. Rule 710, any runner shall be called out on appeal when A, after a fly ball is caught, he fails to retouch his original base before he or his original base is tagged. Retouch in this rule means to tag up and start from a contact with the base after the ball is caught or the ball is touched. A runner is not permitted to take a flying start from a position in back of his base. An appeal should be clearly intended as an appeal, either by a verbal request by the player or an act that unmistakably indicates an appeal to the umpire. In this play, the runner clearly did not retouch the base after the ball was caught. The ball was thrown into second base, so it's unmistakable to the umpire that an appeal is being made. But the player may appeal and touch the base, or if it's unmistakable to the umpire, the umpire shall call the out. In this play, if the runner was scrambling back to the base while the throw was being made there, it would be unmistakable to the umpire that this was an appeal play. A runner's failure to retouch must be made at his original base. If the runner on first took off thinking there was two outs and rounded second, he must be appealed at his original base, which would be first base. They could tag him while off base and get him out, but if they cannot throw to second base and get him out there on appeal, they must throw to first. Appeal plays may require an umpire to recognize an apparent fourth out. If the third out is made during a play in which an appeal play is sustained on another runner, the appeal play decision takes precedence in determining the out. If there is more than one appeal during a play that ends a half inning, the defense may elect to take the out that gives it the advantage. For the purpose of this rule, the defensive team has left the field when the pitcher and all infielders have left fair territory on their way to the bench. This is an example of a fourth out appeal play. There's one out with runners on first and third. The runners are going when the ball is popped up and caught by the pitcher for out number two. 